it's wonderful to see so many of Mel's friends here. And I would like to welcome especially the closest members of his family who meant so much to him. His grandchildren, Rachel and Sam, his daughter, Dara, Dara Charney, and son-in-law, Cameron McKenzie, and the superb author and comrade, La Ceremonia and Charney. The friends of Mel on the stage will discuss special aspects of the work of this extraordinarily intelligent, thoughtful, creative, innovative artist and its impact, the impact of his work. I will introduce them chronologically, chronologically that is within the time that they entered Mel's spheres. Spheres are not different, but holistic, as they call us. I'm an artist, actually, because I met Mel in 1959 and 60, when we were both graduate students at the Yale School of Architecture. And it would be a decade uh, uh, before uh, we became very close friends. That was, I, he came back to Montreal much earlier than I was, I'll tell that in a minute, and I came back in 72, 73, something like that. Um, in 1961, Mel was in Paris, where I was amazed to learn he worked for the Prix de Rome architect Guillaume Gillet. Later this evening, I'll have something more to say about Gillet. In Montreal, in 1963, Mel was a lecturer in design and construction at the new École d'Architecture, Université de Montréal, which had just been created after a major reform of the former École des Beaux-Arts de Montréal. I think that uh, very few people, except outside of the school, really understand that he was there at the formation of that school which seems unbelievable, actually. 1964 was a brand new year. While also teaching Mel work, one of the most interesting architects then in Montreal, Victor Prusse, and he opened his own studio, Mel did. Uh, his artwork was chosen for an exhibition at the Museum, Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and he participated in a week-long conference at Cranbrook, Michigan, where he met, among others, Colin Rowe and Rainer Barnum, and the latter, gave him the, large, the latest issue of the significant little magazine, Archigram, Archigram. By 1964, all these elements were there. All the elements were there. Working in architecture and photography that he had pursued since 1960, when a scholarship allowed him to study uh, the structure and surface of structures in Italy, Sicily, Greece, and Turkey, writing for intellectual magazines, and making art. He was in communion with the avant-garde theoreticians and artists. There was also the passion for the un uncommon books, and he was teaching in a place that was not then as a business as usual, uh, at, the, at the UDM, which was not a school of business as usual, and the school that Mel helped found. I have asked George Baird to speak at this juncture and to introduce, you know, everybody will speak after I stop speaking. Um, at this juncture to introduce an intellectual voyage. Architect and educator and author, the architectural theorist in Canada of the time, George is Dean Emeritus at the School of Architecture of UDM, of, of UDC, sorry, after many years teaching at Harvard. Like Mel in Montreal, uh, in Toronto, George mentored and formed generations of architects out of the wilderness of trade and commerce. Revenons au trajet de Mel, uh, cofondateur de l'école d'architecture en 1964. Mel a également dirigé la faculté d'aménagement entre 68 et 72, ainsi que le très important unité d'architecture urbaine en 1978 jusqu'à 1999. Alan Knight, professeur à engagé à l'école d'architecture du UDM, qui avait étudié à l'AA en London avant, va nous parler de ces années et leur implication, les années, c'est-à-dire avec l'unité d'architecture urbaine, et leur implication et de même qui ne développe pas la notion d'architecture comme pratique publique prenant ses racines dans la société même. Serge Caro, urbaniste, uh, force au département de planification, planification, planification à la ville 
a été engagé par Mel en 65 comme professeur à l'Université de Montréal et il devena le directeur de l'école d'architecture euh, entre 60 et 74. Euh, euh, alors, <coughs> par la suite, il a interchangé beaucoup avec l'unité d'architecture et il va discuter la grande importance de l'unité et son apport, un nouveau regard sur la ville et développement de nouveaux lexiques méthodologiques. Charlie's public involvement in Montreal's art world started in 1972 with his organi organization at the Museum, Montreal Museum of Fine Art of the collective exhibition Montréal Plus ou Moins. Plus ou Oh, I'm sorry, plus ou moins, Montreal plus or minus. It was then that I returned to Montreal and was one of the authors of Exploring Montreal with Mel, whose chapter was entitled, his chapter was entitled, Understanding My Montreal. And we both became <coughs> good friends, public actors in the political debate surrounding the destruction of Montreal's popular neighborhoods, which Mel most famously marked with Les Maisons de la Rue Sherbrooke, Uh, in Montreal in 1976, uh, which was part, of course, uh, a corridor, which was thrown down, as you all know, overnight by Mayor Drapeau. Mayor continued the intervention of large-scale politically-oriented constructions with a uh, Chicago construction and his first permanent installation, the Canadian Tribute to Human Rights of 1987, the CCA Garden, 1987 to 99. And in 2004, he completed a major co uh, commission for the uh, city of Sherbrooke, Quebec, comprising an esplanade, a square, and an integrated sculpture marking the historic center of that town. Je suis fort heureuse que la discussion continue avec Odile Deck. Est-ce qu'on peut avoir une image d'Odile Odile pour l'instant? Parce qu'elle est là à Paris. Et elle va intervenir, elle va euh, rester euh, derrière l'écran euh, jusqu'à ce qu'elle parle et puis après ça, elle va parler avec tout, tout le reste. Peut-être qu'elle viendra. Ah, oh, voilà, voilà. <rire> Bonjour, Odile. <rire> Formidable. Euh, architecte et urbaniste française qui, en 1996, euh, a reçu le lion d'or de la Biennale d'architecture de Venise. Et par, parmi ses œuvres se trouve le Macro Museo des Arts Contemporaines de, de Roma, complété en 1909, et Fantôme, un merveilleux restaurant à l'Opéra Garnier à Paris, euh, livré en juin 2011, et j'ai déjeuné la semaine, il y a deux semaines peut-être, avec elle là-bas. Pédagogue dans le sens de Melvin, Odile fut réélu en 2011 pour un nouveau mandat à l'école spéciale d'architecture. Et elle va parler de <coughs> Manel et son art. Depuis 1972, l'œuvre de Manel fut exposée dans, dans de nombreuses expositions mondialement. Wendy Owens, oh, je, je, okay. um, Wendy Owens a, uh, uh, non, uh, on, pardon, en 2002, le uh, Museum of uh, Contemporary Art organized a retrospective exhibition focusing on relationships between his photography, photo-based paintings, and installations. And Wendy Owen, who is a uh, consulting curator and is now works in the, out of the office office at McGill, and has worked with the CC on its holdings. <coughs> Gordon Mata Clark, of course, an architect and an artist who has an affinity with Mel's work, will bring the curator's viewpoint to bear on Melvin's methodology and ideas. Wendy worked with him creating the exhibition entitled From Observation to Invention, the Painted Photographs of Melvin Charney, presented at the America Society, New York, in 2008. Um, and I think I'll stop here for the moment. And, um, People can come up, stand up here if they like, or they can sit in their seat, whatever. George, you're on. Thank you so much. 
this mic working? Yes, I can tell. <clears throat> well, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. Um, uh, two or three years ago, Louis Martin, who's here tonight, um, uh, um, emailed me and asked me if I would be willing to be a contributor to, uh, to write an essay um, in, uh, contributing uh, as a contribution to an anthology of pretty well Melvin's complete writings. I was not like as I am honored tonight to be here. I was honored to be asked to do that. Um, and I did prepare uh, <clears throat> such an essay, um, which I'll <clears throat> uh, cite briefly at the end of my remarks. Um, uh, but in preparing, um, Louis sent me virtually all the writings of Melvin. <clears throat> Um, and I discovered reading through them that, of course, I wasn't familiar with the earliest ones. Um, and this led to an interesting discussion, in, in one respect at least, between Melvin and myself about when we actually met. Um, I know I had met him by 1972 because I came to Montreal to see Montréal plus ou moins, and Melvin personally handed me a copy of the catalog for that exhibition, which is still on my bookshelf in Toronto. So I know we were friends by 1972, um, but I'm pretty sure we had connections before that, though in a conversation with him in 2010, neither he nor I could remember exactly how we first met. Anne Charney said before we began this evening that she thinks it was in 1969 and that she remembers a black leather jacket. And um, <laughs> these are both plausible suppositions. Um, so I, but Melvin, of course, had begun his career, um, as Phyllis has already pointed out, as an architect, as an artist, and as a writer um, almost a decade before that. Um, and so it was those early works that, uh, of his that were the ones which were the freshest for me, because, of course, from 1972 on, I followed his activities with interest and um, uh, had a greater degree of familiarity with them already. But I, I do actually see him in a way as a soulmate, and I, I want to start by saying something biographical about that. This, um, the project of the book made me aware of a series of biographical parallels between Charney's career and my own, especially in their respective early stages. In a 2010 conversation with him, I learned that he is roughly four years older than I am. He attended the architecture program at McGill University uh, from 1952 until 1958, while I attended the one at the University of Toronto from 1957 until 1962. In that same conversation, we agreed that we had gone to the uh, first architecture schools we did on account of the simple fact that they were programs that were readily available to us in our respective home cities. In the same conversation, I learned that we even have family political backgrounds in common. Like my own father, Charney's was an active supporter of David Lewis and of his original political party, the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the venerable left of center Canadian political party that was the historic predecessor of today's MDP. Both Charney and I felt restless after graduation from our respective first professional programs. He told me that he was encouraged to pursue further study by a McGill mentor, Peter Collins. In consequence, we both undertook post-professional graduate study. Charney attended the Yale Architecture School from 1958 until 59. <clears throat> After completing graduate study, he spent several years traveling in Europe and the Middle East, as well as living in Paris. He returned to Montreal to stay only in 1964. In approximate parallel, I worked for Toronto architect Jerome Markson from 1962 until 1964, when I moved to London, England, and studied for three years at the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College. Upon his return to Montreal in 1964, Melvin began his academic career at l'Université de Montréal. I returned to Toronto in 1967 and began my career at the University of Toronto in 1968. 
So you can see this um, uh, kind of startling parallelism between uh, the, the young Montrealer and the young Torontonian um, was quite moving for both of us to discover. Working through the text, I also discovered with some surprise of the interest Melvin had in the period before I knew him in what I have called liberatory technology. Phyllis has already referred to his interest in the work of Archigram, and certainly Archigram were um, very, very prominent in London in my years there. I actually taught with Peter Cook at the Architectural Association. Um, but that was a side of Melvin that I only learned about from reading the early essays. And it's certainly true, I think, that in the 1960s, he had always had, from the very beginning, a kind of anti-elitist anti kind of sensibility about architecture. And as far as I could tell from the successive writings, strove from the very beginning to find a way of thinking about architecture and making architecture which was not elitist. And one of the earliest kind of modalities of that quest on his part was clearly the exploration of what I've called liberatory technology. Parts of buildings that move at the will of the inhabitant and so forth. Um, but interestingly enough, for me, by the time of Montréal plus ou moins, his thinking had begun to shift. Um, and it's that shift, I worked in uh, community activism in Toronto trying to stop urban renewal. And again, as Phyllis has already mentioned, she and Melvin and many others here worked on parallel projects here in Montreal. And those projects sort of grew ever more consequential from the late 60s through into the 1970s. So uh, th for those of you who remember Montréal plus ou moins, it was a fairly aggressively critical set of documents about urban life and urban form in Montreal, and indeed, in a certain kind of way, could have could be seen to be a kind of precursor of what Melvin would later do in 1976 with the controversial Corridor project, which of course was similarly critical of lots of urban planning policies in the city. So I actually watched Melvin lose confidence in the idea of technique as a vehicle for human liberation and to move instead to a kind of interest in history and memory and the vernacular and the ways in which those could be bound together in art um, cultural production. And I just want, in conclusion, I just want to speak to the three projects which I talk about in detail in my essay in the upcoming book. Uh, the first one is his project from 1971 for a memorial. It was an entry in a competition run by the federal government for a, a, an Air Force memorial. And Melvin actually tried to articulate a kind of non-site specific monument out of elements, pieces, sites, associated with the history of Air the Air Force on various places across Canada. My argument um, about that is that while it was a provocative idea and it was certainly consistent with his political and social interests at the time, he didn't find a way to monumentalize those fragments in such a way as to actually enable it to be read readable as a monument, let alone a memorial. Um, but the, the, the interests which led him to that approach did not leave him, and, and it is in that respect that I actually think that Corridart was such a triumph, because Corridart was vernacular, it was historical, it captured the memory of the city, it was in the street, so it was actually had the popular characteristic of being accessible to the population of the city as a whole, and it made a very aggressive critique of the forms of urban development in, in, the, in the city at the time. No wonder Mayor Drapeau was upset. <laughs> Although uh, the, it will go down in history as a very black mark on his uh, reputation as the mayor of Montreal that this, project, this extraordinary project was demolished during the night before the Olympics even opened. That brings me to the last project, which conveniently for my purposes is on the screen, the Garden for the CCA, 
which is relatively late in Melvin's career, and which I see as kind of elegiac of the kinds of interests in the city of Montreal, which had been with him all along. The CCA Garden is not aggressive and polemical in the way that Corridart was, but it does speak to the history of Montreal, to the history of architecture in Montreal, to the topography in the city. I mean, this could hardly be a better image for my purposes where we see both the plateau and the industrial and working class city beneath it, and then the, this kind of reprised history of architecture within the monuments which comprise the garden. He was a remarkable man. He was a wonderful friend. Um, Phyllis has said, referred to me as a theorist. I know Louis thinks Melvin is the other Canadian theorist. I could not be happier to have had such a companion in that enterprise, and I repeat my pride at being invited to be with you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, for that introduction. It, it really laid the table for, for the meal that I'm going to serve up now, which is going to be a very short fast food meal. I, uh, je, je me sens un petit peu uh, uh, gêné d'explorer de, l'enseignement de, de Melvin parce que ça avait tellement de différents aspects et c'était un objet bougeant. Ça a changé sa configuration uh, pendant les années. Mais néanmoins, Pour euh, la simplicité, euh, je vais faire peut-être trois, quatre pointes. Euh, je me sens un peu comme un papillon de, qui euh, tombe euh, arbitrairement un petit peu sur les, euh, les différents aspects. Mais euh, mon femme était euh, professeur et, d'une certaine manière, assisté à la fondation de, de l'École d'architecture de l'Université de Montréal en 1964. Mais en 1964, je pense qu'on doit parler de l'École de Beaux-Arts, si je ne me trompe pas. Je n'étais pas là, non Et, et que peut-être la faculté de l'aménagement venait plus tard. <rire> euh, donc, euh, il assistait aussi euh, à, à la, la formation de la, la faculté de l'aménagement, le choix peut-être de ce mot-là, parmi d'autres personnes. Et il a mis sur pied euh, les études supérieures dans cette nouvelle école. Euh, la faculté est donc... Euh, Il me semble, à cette époque-là, un amalgame de l'École de Beaux-Arts en architecture et euh, l'Institut d'urbanisme. Donc, déjà, euh, Melvin euh, voguait dans euh, les deux euh, disciplines, d'une certaine manière. Euh, il rédige alors, euh, en 71, euh, un article que je trouvais euh, beaucoup plus tard, évidemment. Euh, je suis arrivé en 75 à Montréal. Um, un article qui était, euh, euh, disons, une conférence dans la série GA de Sèvres, 71, une conférence d'une importance euh, euh, vraiment euh, majeure pour son enseignement, ses, ses, ses conférences, ses études sur l'architecture au Québec. Euh, grosso modo, on peut dire que l'enseignant de Melvin cherchait les règles des processus de la transformation de la ville par l'architecture, donc dans ce sens-là, une architecture urbaine. Il représente euh, euh, pour moi euh, quelqu'un qui était fasciné avec tous les aspects de l'histoire de l'art, de l'histoire de l'architecture, mais une chose pour laquelle il avait une affection particulière, c'était bien évident, évidemment, les constructivistes, et je me souviens euh, dans la maison euh, Euh, sur Melrose, euh, à l'étage, il y avait euh, un petit tableau euh, sur un mur qui, euh, qui était le... Euh, attends, je le cherche. Euh, une, une version de l'architecton, un architecton de Malevich posé devant les gratte ciel de New York. Et la juxtaposition est assez bizarre parce que le Les deux perspectives sont complètement différentes euh, et euh, j'avais toujours interprété ça comme l'intention 
de transformer même la métropole euh, dense euh, par l'architecture et qu'il me semblait que cette image était particulièrement signifiante. Um, donc, um, ce montage est un une analogue dans mon esprit de la transformation de la ville et c'était ça le sens de son enseignement. Il était un magnifique pédagogue, un, 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 un très bon euh, éducateur, si on peut utiliser cet anglicisme. Um, et, et pour revenir à la, la, le texte de, de, um, de Melvin de 71, euh, euh, qui était euh, livré dans cette euh, conférence, um, il, euh, il a essayé d'analyser l'histoire de l'architecture du Québec euh, en termes non élitistes, en termes d'une espèce de savoir-faire inné dans les gens du Québec. Et je pense que euh, toutes ces, ces conférences qui touchaient à l'architecture du Québec avaient touché énormément de Québécois euh, et peut-être euh, permis plusieurs étudiants d'assumer euh, le, le revenir dans le métier d'architecture. Euh, on peut résumer son approche euh, à l'enseignement de l'architecture par une phrase d'une provenance inconnue que euh, qui m'avait fait sauter récemment. Euh, la meilleure forme de la science, c'est l'art. Parce que Melvin avait toujours euh, à son actif une attitude d'analyser froidement les lieux, de, de connaître d'où viennent ces lieux, c'est quoi l'histoire, donc de leur formation. Mais ce n'était pas autant euh, l'histoire qui l'intéressait, mais l'idée de transformer la ville par l'architecture et de le transformer d'une façon authentique. C'est-à-dire on ne va pas analyser les lieux et faire une, une composition académique d'un square. Il faut que ce lieu est issu d'un certain savoir venant, au moins connecté avec le peuple, comme Phyllis a dit tout à l'heure. Um, donc, il était un rationaliste et un, un artiste en même temps. Et je pense qu'on peut voir ça aussi dans la façon qu'il organise le travail, que ce soit en art ou euh, plus scientifique. Enfin, j'avance un peu plus vite alors. Um, Melvin n'a jamais hésité de traiter en architecture des questions politiques et ethniques, et éthiques, on a déjà dit ça. Il développe la notion de, de l'architecture comme une pratique publique, donc prenant ses racines dans la société même. Et euh, l'autre aspect euh, de cette conférence de Sèvres, euh, c'était qu'il cherchait incessamment une modernité authentique de l'architecture. Euh, une, une modernité qu'il attribuait à l'Amérique du Nord en général, la culture industrielle américaine et euh, possiblement au Québec même. Um, donc, euh, l'histoire des silos et graines, etc., etc., et la collaboration avec, euh, avec Rena Banham. Um, mais au fond, euh, le souci premier de l'unité architecture urbaine dans les époques qu'on a travaillé ensemble, um, de, de 76 à 84, peut-être, euh, on, on s'intéressait à la transformation de la ville par les interventions architecturales. Donc, l'héritage et la conservation du milieu bâti d'hier n'étaient pas le but de l'exercice. On s'intéressait à l'histoire pour retrouver le code génétique de la transformation possible et authentique de la ville. On proposait donc une tierce voie entre le table et le ras de la ville qui avait toujours cours, euh, et, et sa préservation, bien sûr. Euh, dans les transformations de la ville, l'image souvent utilisée dans les discussions de, de l'hybridisation des types d'architecture, par exemple, qui fait date peut-être maintenant, euh, l'image souvent utilisée était de, de, de faire un projet d'architecture qui était comme un accident d'auto, où deux typologies s'écrasent l'un dans l'autre, et une nouvelle forme euh, d'un bâtiment, un monument ou un fragment de ville euh, est issu de cet accident. Il était très fort, évidemment, sur les écrasements d'avions et, 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 et les accidents. Um, donc, euh, Melvin, un grand pédagogue, avait la donne d'instaurer dans ses étudiants, donné pointe, euh, une grande confiance en eux-mêmes. Ça m'avait toujours étonné que les étudiants quittaient l'Italie 
avec une certaine aisance. Il avait compris des choses, il, il en était fier, et je constate que c'était grâce à l'érudition et la clarté d'expression de Melvin euh, et sa capacité d'intégrer toutes sortes d'idées sur la profession, euh, sur l'architecture, sur les détails d'architecture, et la ramener au peuple, euh, qui permettait les étudiants d'avoir cette aisance que je crois qu'ils euh, ils, ils ont toujours aujourd'hui. Bonsoir et euh, d'abord je voudrais remercier Félix de me donner l'opportunité de parler quel, en quelques mots de Melvin. Melvin, je l'ai connu il y a, en 1965 et, euh, et on a cheminé ensemble pendant 12 ans euh, côte à côte euh, à l'Université de Montréal, à l'École d'architecture. On a travaillé ensemble, on a fait des bons coups ensemble, d'autres moins bons. Mais euh, j'ai travaillé de façon très, très étroite. Enseignant avec lui, euh, on a fait de la recherche ensemble. Et par la suite, on s'est quitté. Hein? J'ai laissé l'Université de Montréal et j'étais dans d'autres fonctions. Et quand j'ai euh, joint la ville de Montréal, allez, dans les années, quatre, fin des années 80, euh, c'était à l'époque de, ambitieuse de faire le premier plan d'urbanisme de la ville de Montréal. Et avec Melvin et tout ce qui avait été fait dans l'atelier de l'unité d'architecture urbaine, je, on s'est dit ensemble, il faut qu'il contribue de façon plus concrète à la réalisation de ce premier plan d'urbanisme. Alors, comme Melvin euh, n'avait pas peur de relever des défis, et euh, il était meilleur quand les défis étaient encore les plus, euh, les plus difficiles, euh, je vais, on a concocté... Euh, un mandat qui consistait à travailler, à proposer euh, euh, un apport au plan d'urbanisme d'un secteur les plus des, des structures de Montréal, qui, était le, qui est le Faubourg Saint-Laurent. Alors, c'était une étude qui devait, qui a servi à l'élaboration du premier plan d'urbanisme, euh, qui a qui était un, un apport incroyable, à mon sens, en termes de méthodologie, en termes de développer une nouvelle, une nouvelle approche, une nouvelle façon de voir la ville. Et ça, c'est très peu connu, sauf de, des étudiants qui ont travaillé à cela, qui ont, qui ont, qui ont été son professeur, et, euh, et ça s'était perdu un peu dans le décor avec le temps. J'ai eu l'occasion de revoir euh, cette étude-là et de la relire, elle est encore d'une très grande actualité. Euh, il y a des choses qui, sont, qui ont été faites dans la, en termes d'aménagement dans le secteur Faubourg-Saint-Laurent et qui euh, sont le résultat des propositions que Melvin avait sorties, euh, avait avancé, notamment la, pla, la formation de la place de la paix. Alors, dans son lexique, les places, il avait étudié toutes les places le long de Saint-Laurent, et il y a place de la paix qui devait ouvrir sur un évêque. Melvin a proposé qu'elle soit plutôt, comme les autres places le long du boulevard Saint-Laurent, elle soit plutôt fermée à René-Lévesque. Et ça a été, euh, alors qu'il y avait eu tous des projets élaborés pour la nouvelle place, euh, on a réussi à faire changer la décision des, 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 euh, des élus de l'époque pour faire en sorte que la place soit ce qu'elle est présentement. Le, ce secteur-là de la ville est développé sensiblement sur les paramètres que, qui avait été avancé dans l'étude de Melvin. Et euh, par ailleurs, euh, les deux autres secteurs au sud de René-Lévesque jusqu'à jusqu Saint-Antoine et, euh, et l'autre partie de Sainte-Catherine jusqu'à euh, Ontario, ces deux secteurs qui encore là euh, euh, sont encore en devenir. Et plusieurs éléments de, de, des propositions sont encore d'actualité et à mon sens, ce qui serait la, la chose la plus extraordinaire pour Melvin, euh, c'est qu'on puisse que la ville et les planificateurs, les urbanistes, les architectes puissent reprendre ça et faire une nouvelle démarche de plan particulier d'urbanisme pour compléter le secteur du Faubourg-Saint-Laurent tel qu'il avait été envisagé à l'époque par Melvin. Je pense que c'est 
Euh, il y a un article qui est en préparation pour euh, publication prochainement et ce sera une autre façon de, de mettre en valeur et de faire connaître ce qu'est qu l'étude elle-même. Alors, merci, Félix. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, je ne comprends plus bien. Parce que moi, j'ai beaucoup de soucis. Je la... Vous m'entendez là ou pas? Je ne sais pas. Donc, j'espère que vous m'entendez. Donc, je vais raconter. Moi, je, effectivement, je suis très impressionnée de voir que les personnes qui, sont, qui ont parlé avant moi connaissait Melvin depuis beaucoup plus longtemps. Moi, j'ai rencontré Melvin à la fin des années 80, au début des années 90 à Paris, euh, à, par l'intermédiaire de quelqu'un qui vient également de décéder, ce qui est un peu impressionnant parce que ça fait tous les deux d'un coup. C'était Michel Verne. Et Michel Verne a été mon professeur à l'école d'architecture à Paris, à la Villette, en, au début de, dans les années 70, et il est resté un ami parce que c'était quelqu'un qui était totalement fascinant, totalement non conventionnel, et quelqu'un qui était en même temps un historien et un curieux du monde et de la société. Et je dirais que lorsque j'ai rencontré Melvin à Paris à cette, à, au début des années 90, ou à la fin des années 80, je ne sais plus exactement, c'est en fait, ils étaient amis parce qu'ils qu ils étaient, ils étaient pareils. Et Melvin était aussi quelqu'un de non conventionnel. La, ensuite, j'ai retrouvé Melvin à la Biennale d'architecture de Venise en 1992, et c'est là où je l'ai connu plus, plus précisément puisqu'il euh, euh, il, m'a emmené et on a, on, pendant deux jours, on a marché et on a visité ensemble toute l'exposition dans les, dans, dans les Giardini et à l'Arsenal, et il m'a emmené dans toutes les expositions qu'il y avait autour de la Biennale. Et c'est là que j'ai découvert finalement ce promeneur, parce que c'était un promeneur de la ville, quelqu'un qui était capable en même temps de raconter la ville en permanence tout en la, tout en la, tout en la, en la déambulant, et euh, ce qui était d'ailleurs un une caractéristique identique de ce qu'avait Michel Verne à l'époque, mais qui était en même temps, tout le temps, en train de... qui était non, non satisfait, qui était toujours non satisfait de la façon dont les choses étaient faites, de la façon dont les choses étaient de, de, faites de façon convenue, de la façon dont les politiques traitaient la ville, et qui parlait en permanence de ça. La, puis j'ai... Il m'a invité à venir enseigner, il, a, il, a, il a suggéré à l'époque au directeur de, de l'école d'architecture, du département d'architecture de l'Université de Montréal, de me faire venir à Montréal. Et je suis venue enseigner pendant un mois dans ce fameux atelier triptyque de l'époque. Et, euh, et là, j'ai rencontré également Anne, parce que pour moi, euh, Melvin n'est pas dissociable de Anne. Melvin et Anne étaient des amis, tous les deux ensemble. Et c'était un couple que je rencontrais aussi bien à Montréal qu'à Paris quand ils venaient. Le, et c'est à, à cette époque-là, en 1992, quand, quand je suis venue à Montréal, que euh, j'ai eu l'occasion également de discuter souvent avec Melvin, puisque je le revoyais à l'école d'architecture et que euh, allais, nous, allions, nous allions dîner très, très souvent ensemble avec lui tout seul ou avec Anne. Et j'avais découvert une chose et nous avions un, un point commun c'est que lui et moi, lorsque nous arrivions dans, un magasin, dans, un, dans une boutique de presse, nous n'allions pas forcément chercher les quotidiens, nous, étions, nous allions regarder, les, nous allions acheter les, les magazines de voitures et d'avions, les magazines qui, qui montraient les, les voitures et les avions, parce que nous étions fascinés par ces objets technologiques qui, euh, et dont, dont j'ai compris après, petit à petit, pourquoi Melvin avait aussi cet attachement. Lorsque je voyais, lorsqu lorsque j'ai découvert le, à cette époque-là également, le jardin de, du CCA dont, la, dont une partie seulement était construite en France et qui euh, était ces constructions déconstruites ou ces déconstructions construites, si je puis dire, de, euh, qui parlaient à la fois d'architecture, de la ville et de, et de notre monde. C'était vraiment quelque chose que, qui m'a fasciné. J'ai aussi... Euh, euh, il y avait aussi euh, la découverte de, de... Parce que moi, je ne sais pas analyser, je ne sais pas être critique d'architecture, je, je ne sais pas expliquer et décrire les choses, mais je pourrais dire comment elles, elles m'ont touché. Ce qui m'avait également totalement fasciné chez, dans, la, dans le travail de, de Melvin, c'était les immeubles qui dansent, les immeubles qui marchent, les immeubles qui courent. Et euh, c'était 
je les ai revus récemment, je les ai revus plus récemment en 2008 à l'exposition à New York, parce que j'avais été, j'avais été à l'inauguration, et, euh, et je trouvais que ces immeubles avaient à la fois quelque chose de totalement insolite, quelque chose de, de comment je pourrais dire, de, de, d'énergique, quelque chose de, de, de représentation du temps qui passe, du temps qui file, de la, de, la, de, la non, de la volonté de ne pas décrire la ville comme quelque chose de statique, quelque chose qui est en mouvement et en même temps quelque chose dans lequel on ne sait que passer. Peut-être que c'est une interprétation personnelle. Mais euh, voilà, je ne sais pas comment dire plus à propos de son travail parce que je, je l'ai connu au travers des livres, je l'ai connu un peu au travers des œuvres que Melvin m'a montrées, de sculptures que j'ai vues à Montréal et surtout de l'exposition que j'ai vue à, à que je, à laquelle je suis allée à New York plus récemment. Mais euh, ce qui me semble important de garder de Melvin, c'est que c'était quelqu'un qui était en questionnement permanent, en regard critique, en, en, en position critique par rapport au monde dans lequel, il est, dans lequel il était, dans le monde qui l'entourait, et par rapport à la façon dont les hommes politiques inter, intervenaient sur la ville et voulaient, euh, ne, vou, ne voulaient pas suffisamment permettre à la ville de, de se transformer et d'évoluer. Voilà, c'est ce que je voulais dire ce soir. to see, I guess you should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the deal gets to watch. I'm glad Odile mentioned the show in New York, which she, she was there at the opening. So um, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit more about that exhibition, which was my experience of working directly with, with Melvin. Melvin Charney and other architects who become artists can create problems for the more conventional among us. Their fellow architects may view them as having abandoned the profession, while artists see them as individuals who are never truly members of their club. They confound both art historians and architectural historians who have trouble categorizing them or figuring out where to put them in the survey books. Their work seems almost suspended between two worlds. But among the small group of thoughtful, expressive architects who see themselves as artists as well, there is no confusion. Throughout his career, Melvin Charney skillfully navigated the narrow border that lies between art and architecture. Although he disliked the term artist-architect, preferring to be called an artist, It was clear to those intent on appreciating and understanding his work, rather than worrying about putting it in a particular box, that architecture always informed what he did. By the time Mel and I worked together in 2008 on an exhibition that became Between Observation and Intervention, the painted photographs of Melvin Charney at America's Society in New York, I'd actually known him and his work for 15 years. I knew him to be thoughtful, literate, dedicated to his work, and a tireless observer of contemporary culture, and in particular, architecture and cities. The best art makes you see everything a little differently. The effect that art has on your consciousness does not end when you leave a gallery or a park, but affects your worldview. Certainly, this is true of Melvin's work. It makes me look more closely at the layering in the real city, how buildings relate to their surroundings, how words and images work together in newspapers, and how it all mixes up in our minds to give us a broader sense of the places where we live. In 
In conceptualizing an exhibition of his work, I chose to focus on Melvin's painted photographs, compelling works of art that one could enjoy on many levels. Their design and color makes them pop visually, but the possibility is always there to dig deeper and read them, take apart the layers and see how the images and the words on the page from the newspaper or the magazine are augmented, explained, and emphasized by the images painted on top of them. I found his anthropomorphized running buildings who scamper on their pylons amusing, but also thought-provoking, as their titles told us they were tenements on the move or blocks running scared, and decided to include some of the sculptures that, go with, uh, that are part of this series as well in the exhibition. And like those running blocks, my experience of curating exhibitions is that you spend a lot of time on the move and running scared. While organizing the painted photographs, we face problems with funding, partnerships, loans, broken promises, and even broken bones, literally. I titled one email, Hire a Shaman, when it seemed like nothing was going right and it was time to engage a witch doctor. But Mel and I would talk through each problem, and he was remarkably calm as we worked through each crisis and came up with a plan. By the end, we had many things go right. Friends and colleagues, including Phyllis Lambert, provided good counsel and kept us believing until all at once, it seemed, donors and foundations on both sides of the border stepped up to support the show. Funding came from the province, the federal government, and the New York State Council on the Arts. A fabulous partnership developed with the Musée National des Beaux-Arts du Québec and owners of works, some of whom were initially quite reluctant because they loved the art, agreed to lend the works. For me, I have to admit that Mel was an exacting taskmaster. Why are you choosing this work, he would ask me, and not that one. Why that idea and what do you mean? When we laid out the exhibition using woefully inaccurate floor plans, and you see it there, sent from New York, a bad idea when the artist is also an architect. We spent hours in the studio debating the wall colors, the placement, the flow. To be successful, we knew that the show had to make sense, not just to us, but to every visitor. And we had to send one plan to the installation team in New York, not a transcript of a debate. With the help of architect Cecile Baird, we made a real plan and sent it off. Once the team in New York got started, we received a frantic phone call. To begin with, they said, the colors do not work. We waited. The second call was a report, well, after all, the colors were quite effective once the entire space was painted. I flew down to New York to find that everything had been installed, but that our plan had been altered because, of course, the measurements they'd sent were worse than we thought, and despite dozens of emails and phone calls, when we asked for more information, things did not fit as we expected. With the team in New York, I made adjustments, and finally, it worked. It flowed. But when Mel arrived two days later and showed up at the gallery, hours before expected, I got a panicked call from the director, get here fast. Mel is not pleased. I rushed to the gallery, defended the changes, and waited for judgment. Mel, natural teacher that he was, listened to me, thought, and then pronounced my judgment to be sound. I miss Mel and think back a lot now on those many conversations we had while organizing the exhibition. Every conversation would end with the same refrain from Mel. It's going to be great. It's going to be a great show. There is no stronger message of encouragement from a teacher to a student than it is going to be great. And all of us need teachers even after we're long out of school. Good ideas and good comments make me determined to work hard and make it really great. I'm a better curator and a better writer, thanks to Mel. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank everyone.
and Odile, uh, uh, most especially for staying up so late and joining us. Uh, I think that we, is there any, you know, it seemed to me that there was a kind of contrast in what we were discussing because you, some of you were discussing the technological issues. George was, and uh, I think well, you were too. And yet, one, that's not, one th one thing, not, not a thing one thinks about in Mel's one th work. One thinks much more of uh, the political. I mean, his, you know, we didn't talk about those great uh, projects that he did on, um, what we have that, it's, you see, what is it called, the? Um, Dictionnaire. Hmm? The Dictionnaire. Yeah, Dictionnaire. You know, and, and these kind of things. And the technological, that's not a problem. It's, it, it's, I mean, he's, he, he, like all of us, he learned his, 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 his materials. And so I, 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 I'm, I'm somewhat uh, mystified by the, that emphasis on the technological. George, do you have any comment on that? Uh, well, well, I only mentioned it because it was new to me, because it, it was in the, in the earlier part of Melvin's career before I actually met him and got to know um, the nature of his interests. And um, uh, since I have now, courtesy of Louis Martin, read all of the texts in succession, I mean, I found it fascinating to, to watch the migration of his thought uh, from the middle 60s. In the, in, in, in the middle 1960s, he actually still has good things to say about Place Victoria, for example, um, and other, um, the, the um, underground walkway system in Montreal. His, his interests could be seen to be those of a, an advanced mainstream architect and architectural thinker. But the longer the 60s go on, and then when the citizen activism begins, um, the, the term I use is that his view of technology and of the impact of corporate technologies in particular on the city begins to darken considerably. And so by the time of um, Montréal plus ou moins, he's into a much more aggressively critical frame of reference. And of course, in the run-up to the Olympics in, in 76, the kind of fairly drastic transformations of parts of Montreal via various mechanisms and of urban renewal and uh, preparation for the Olympics provoke considerable ire on his part. So I see him as migrating from a an optimistic pro-technology position at the, be not the very beginning of his career, but in the mid-60s, through to something which, as you pointed out, becomes much more political. And in, indeed, my perspective on it is that uh, Corridart was the zenith of his political engagement in those respects. And he was so, <laughs> I mean, I, he, I didn't see Corridart because it was already gone before I got to the <laughs> Olympics, but I had been in Montreal with Melvin when he was working on it, and he gave me long explanations of what he was doing and what things were going to be in it and what the techniques would be. So I had a very good idea of what it was going to be like. Um, and I, uh, much as he was being a very, very militant provocateur, I don't think he had any idea of how hard he would be hit by what happened. I mean, I think he was devastated by the destruction of Corridart, and that in a certain sense, I would venture to say that his, um, his kind of engagement in the, in the world of politics after that was much more modulated, and the, the opportunities offered by the Viennese of museums for installations, as opposed to the street, mm. Um, mm. began to interest him much mm. more. Thank you. There's a very interesting point, Serge. Je vois que vous vous tenez à cette question aussi. Ça marche pas? Oui, ça marche. Production and uh, adéquacy of low income housing. And c'était quasiment une enquête qu'on faisait, et qu'on faisait venir les chasseurs de la SPHL d'Ottawa, et on les avait une fin de semaine, puis on passait à travers euh, les documents. 
et on faisait vraiment parce qu'on voulait démontrer que finalement, c'était des gestes qui étaient les décisions qui ont conduit au développement de l'ensemble des logements à loyer abordable à Montréal surtout. Ben, il y avait toujours des décisions plus ou moins claires, plus ou moins nettes. Euh, on retrouvait toujours les mêmes. On faisait une enquête. Et Melvin, il était passionné de ça. Ça, c'est en 70-71. On a remis le rapport en 72-73, je crois. Et on avait travaillé deux ans dessus. Mais après ça, il a changé progressivement euh, de position euh, beaucoup plus. Quand il, quand il est devenu l'artiste, par rapport à l'architecte, professeur, il a. Sa façon de voir le monde a changé. Et il l'a représenté de façon différente. Très, très important. Odile, oui. est-ce que oui. vous avez des commentaires sur ce sujet ou le changement de, de position de Bell à partir de... Moi, je l'ai surtout connu après, si j'ai bien compris, après qu'il ait quitté le... Enfin non, parce qu'il terminait l'enseignement de l'architecture et il était déjà artiste au moment où je l'ai rencontré, puisque c'était le début des années 90. Et, euh, et je pense que, quand je disais tout à l'heure que c'était quelqu'un qui n'était que je le présentais comme quelqu'un de jamais satisfait ou toujours insatisfait, parce qu'il était toujours en, en position, comme je disais tout à l'heure, en position critique par rapport à la, à la façon dont la ville fonctionnait, dans la façon dont les politiques s'occupaient de la ville. Et je pense qu'on a besoin, c est, c est, des, des gens comme Melvin sont indispensables pour pouvoir, pour justement euh, ne, ne jamais accepter les choses telles que, comme, les, comme, comme les gens pensent qu'elles qu doivent, qu doivent être faites de façon convenue et qu'il est important d'avoir autour de nous toujours quelqu'un qui, en permanence, même si c'est même si c'est parfois agaçant, même si c'est parfois trop, mais qui en permanence n'est jamais satisfait de la de ce qui de ce, de ce qui se passe et qui remet en cause la façon dont les choses se font. Et je pense que Melvin faisait partie des des gens comme ça qui euh, des gens qui, qui jalonnent notre parcours et qui sont des questionneurs, des des gens qui qui nous amènent à nous poser des questions et à ne jamais nous satisfaire nous-mêmes des choses convenues. Merci, ce sont des questions. Alan? Alan? Try it in English. Uh, in English, yes. yes um, I'm not sure that I, I am following this conversation. Um, I think he was interested in the American aspects of technology as basically a liberating influence. Mm -hmm. and, and American technology becomes let's say, uh, the grain silo, and in, uh, in the grain silo, oh, the yeah, yeah. grain silo we visited. But that was old, old, old technology. Pardon? That was old technology. It was old technology, but it was a cheval de trois, it was a Trojan horse in the article, because in fact he comes back and says, well, maybe Le Corbusier didn't know how to mend a fuse, and never quite understood how the grain elevator worked, and that somehow, technology had permeated Amer the American way of life and become one with, with the people to a certain extent. So he could tolerate um, tar paper on a house, uh, you know, a primitive house owned by a poor person, like he could tolerate, um, you know, wonderful high modern architecture uh, to a certain point. Um, but I think what happens is that he sees that there's the, the identification of the people with their city which was becoming uh, you know, a, a, a demolition site around um, uh, mm -hmm. the building of um, Place Ville-Marie, for instance, which is always uh, posed in the middle of the uh, uh, rue, uh, Maison de la Rue Sherbrooke, uh, point, point, point. Um, I, I think he, he begins to see that there's a kind of irredu irreducible, <laughs> half in French already, <laughs> um, an irreducible element to the street and the gridiron of uh, North American architecture that the people that were living in the, in the local quarters um, around the time in 57 when the great uh, Revolution Tranquille uh, comes about, um, they, they, were, they were being um, pushed out of their neighborhoods. We were building freeways, you know, uh, following on from the Americans and the interstate system. And I think he took the side of the North American city and the identification of that kind of city 
with the ordinary people that lived in in in, in the neighborhoods, and that and that moved every uh, what what was it the first of May and so on and so forth. And he became really fascinated by images of the people and their relationship to the city. For instance, he he often mentioned. Um, a pl the first apartment that I lived in was in Mentana Street. And it was, um, it was a, a narrow lot where you could only fit, uh, you know, jam in two, uh, two, two buildings. And of course it had port cochere and um, a backyard. And that made uh, for him a kind of cockpit in the Shakespearean sense and, and threw him into even medieval uh, technology as being a way of the people um, you know, um, learning about life through theater, but also the Quebecois living that structure, that same form of a theater in the back uh, yard of, of, of the ELO, of the, uh, of, the, of the urban block. And uh, I think that becomes a, a really big uh, talking point for him. And, and, and changes a little bit his idea. So the underground city in Montreal that he was one of the first to draw as a, as a kind of a, um, a survey drawing of uh, what was going on uh, around Place Ville-Marie, for instance, uh, turns from something very, very positive, it think, I think, in when you see it, its effect on the, on the neighborhoods around it, it becomes a, a negative. So I'm not sure that it's really, the vector is, is technology, except that it's the way that technology permeates North American ways of life, and what is authentic about it, and, and what is a lot of, um, a lot of junk. Wendy, you, you wanted to say something? Well, I was just, I, I could oh, add, George, just, just like, oh, go, go ahead. No, go ahead, George. Well, I, just, it just follows on from Alan's comments. I, I, I mean, I agree exactly with uh, what he said, and I would adduce two points in, re in regard to it. If we talk about the early period and the American interest to, te to technology, I mean, when, when he went to Yale, of course, the, my, the names that came to my mind were Lou Kahn and Paul Rudolph, who were the, the, the well, most famous. The, 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 well, well, interesting to know. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm, just, I'm not talking about that merit. I'm talking just fame. But, but it turns out <laughs> that the, the architect at Yale that was important for Melvin was John Johansson. And he actually writes about Johansson. And when Johansson publishes his work, he asks people to comment. And Melvin is one of the people writing about Johansson's work. And, it's, and Johansson was interested in this. Uh, it's not quite archigram, because he was too interested in cast in place concrete to be archigram. But Johansson was interested in a, a manipulable architecture, the manipulable characteristics of which had what he and Melvin at that time saw as human potential. Um, and, then, and then I agree that that does go from a positive reading in the middle 60s to a much more negative one in the middle 70s. And, but the, in, in, the, in the middle 70s, and it's partly to do, I think, with the, the step from the Air Force Memorial to Corridart, I won't be able to remember the exact date, but we all know his fascination with newspaper clippings. And one of the newspaper clippings in, those, in the early 70s was one of a little house which became known as the Trésor de Trois Rivières. And it was a tiny house, but it had a pediment on the front of it. And Melvin was fascinated with that image, and he actually reproduced the, the facade of the, the, the Trésor in several of his installations. And I think that was the key for him to finding the link between the vernacular and the monument that little house which was so important for him. That's beautiful. Uh, uh, Wendy, you want to go ahead? I, I, my comment's going to follow on yours exactly. Um, we haven't talked yet about Melvin and photography. And Melvin's, I think one of the th things that affects what he did was he was constantly photographing. And in photographing, focusing on things like you know, the vernacular house. And I think as he photographed things and got to know them better and better, it caused a sort of an evolution in, in his thinking of seeing the, the value in the vernacular house and its, its pretensions to, to be monumental um, that goes along in the whole part of his, his career. Um, 
in, I've been working with Anne in, in the studio and in looking at the huge number of photographs that he took. He was constantly photographing and, and when you do that, you look at what you're, what, what you're photographing, you look at the people who, who might live in a house like this and you get to, to know it and sort of see its, its role. So I think that that also has a, a big effect on his, on his thinking. Um, uh, which brings up another aspect is that um, he's going from modernity and modern architecture as a utopia of the future, I think. Um, from looking at things that are here and now around us and the way that people relate to them. And that the, the, uh, the wire services are a kind of vector of how people connect with architecture. Um, you know, through the newspapers, through images, the the famous um, post box in Westmount that was uh, that blew up and so on, they, they became kind of monuments to him as, as a kind of the, the, the technological representation of a, of a disaster that everyone becomes familiar with through the wire services. You know, so that's the vector of the relationship between ordinary people and monumental events. Yeah, there's so much, much here in terms of you know, the change from his experience at Yale when I was there too. I, I, I certainly, you talked about radio lounge and stuff, uh, such things. But and also when he went to Paris, I, I, I was going. Guillaume Gillet was a um, um, actually a, 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 a what is it? A, the, the, you know when you when you do the Paris thing where you. You, you, you go to Rome. It was a Free de Rome. Okay, sorry about that. He was a Free de Rome guy. And he did these, he was very much influenced by Ferré, worked in concrete. And the, it's interesting, a man who's, I've never heard of at all, that Mel Melvin went to work with him. So one, I, I think there's so many interesting things that come up in these uh, discussions. And then also that kind of passion for for, for Montreal, for its neighborhoods, for its quartier. And I had that kind of thing. I, I came, you know, I, I used to say I sort of came from, um, you know, an architect who knew about everything and knew exactly what to do. And I came to Montreal and, um, you know, I joined groups and I'd sit on my hands, you know. It, it was just a very different kind of concept that, that, that happened at that time, a very different kind of training. I, I didn't, of course, I'd gone to IIT and I'd worked with, me. I, after, after Yale, I, I, I changed, I switched. One of the things I really wanted to wonder if we could say anything about tonight, and I think maybe this is the last piece of discussion, uh, is whether, um, what is what, how did Mel, well, I don't know, it's a funny question. The extent of the change that may, 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 Mel engendered, because I mean, I think it, you see that in the work of uh, uh, René Doust, for example, uh, that, that holds fantastic sense he had of taking into the, you know, for example, in the, in the garden here, he's not just looking at the garden, and you see the church, uh, churches in the, in the distance, and Mel had this fantastic stretch, and he's going down to the neighborhood, which is a uh, working class neighborhood, he's putting these things on pedestals, uh, the church, the other uh, major monuments in Montreal on, pe uh, uh, on pedestals. The, the pedestals are made up of the vernacular housing down below, so that these f structures are crushing the vernacular housing. You know, and he's um, he, he, he's looking at that. But how does he, um, you know, the, the the kind of sense of change in what happened to the city? You you mentioned Xerxes about the. Uh, um, question of, of um, Saint, uh, Boulevard saint Laurent and that infill housing kind of project that he did, which I don't know, is, is it ever going to come back to see the light of day? And, 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 and then and also I was talking about, um, the, sorry, I'm, I'm doing two things at once here. I was also talking about the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the inf influence Mel had on, uh, uh, you know, on, on looking at the landscape and the city and, and, the, and the movement. And he was one who raised this, 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 this uh, whole terrace here. And then he, of course, 
then Rani Daoust was very influenced by that and her whole development of the uh, um, uh, Cartier uh, International de Montréal. And he, she was one of his students, of course. And uh, you know, I, I just want to bring this up. Has anybody got any comments on it? Adil, est-ce que vous vous envoyez? Peut-être c'est un peu tard. Mais euh, non, moi, je, mais il y a une chose que je voulais dire aussi, c'est que c'est vrai que Mel photographiait tout le temps et que j'ai été, j'avais, j'avais eu l'occasion de le voir en train de photographier, de, de, de l'accompagner en promenade avec Anne dans, la, dans une forêt. Et en fait, il était fasciné aussi par le travail, par, il y a il tout un travail sur les arbres et tout un travail sur la nature et la façon de, de photographier un arbre en, déco, en le déconstruisant, en le, prendre, en le prenant par photos successives verticalement, qui faisait que quelque part, encore une fois de plus, comme je disais tout à l'heure par rapport aux sculptures qui, aux, qui sont dans le jardin du CCA, ce sont des, des constructions déconstruites ou des déconstructions construites. Mais les arbres, c'était pareil, la façon dont il les photographiait. Et j'avais posé la question de savoir, mais pourquoi il les photographiait de cette façon-là Il m'a dit, parce que j'aime regarder comment, la, la, comment l'arbre a grandi, et quelque part, en les, en les photographiant par morceaux et par tronçons en montant vers le haut, c'est comme si je prenais l'arbre qui, qui, qui croît en même temps. Et donc, c'est quelque chose qui était tout, toujours une façon de regarder différente. Et ça, c'est important de, aussi. C'était vraiment quelque chose qui m'a, qui m'a marqué. Et euh, voilà, donc c'est, c'est un peu différent de la question que vous me posiez, Félix, mais j'avais un peu plus de mal. <rire> Merci. Uh, uh, any, uh, Serge uh, Ça marche Oui. Uh, juste un anecdote, uh, qui est plus qu'un anecdote, en fait. J'ai eu à travailler avec Mel uh, sur un projet mort de Montréal uh, il y a trois ans. Donc, il était dans oui, oui, effectivement, je le connais. Et Philippe, si vous si vous, vous en souvenez. Euh, et il était fantastique parce qu'il reprenait <rire> des choses qu'on avait discutées pendant des années auparavant. C'est bon. <rire> ah, voilà, je l'avais fermé. Excusez-moi. Alors, il reprenait des choses qu'on avait discutées il y a 20 ans auparavant, mais dans une logique incroyable à partir de toute sa réflexion sur la création du jardin du CCA, puisque c'était un terrain qui était à proximité, et euh, essayait de remettre en valeur, en fait, toute sa façon d'analyser les grands éléments importants de la structure urbaine, du passé vers un nouveau présent. Et là, pour lui, c'était un défi, parce que c'est d'essayer d'élargir la portée des gestes qui ont été posés avec la la construction du Centre canadien d'architecture et de son jardin après. Alors, il euh, y a quelques documents qui ne sont pas connus parce que ça n'a pas eu de suite, mais euh, pour moi, c'était une chose assez extraordinaire comme démarche. Merci pour ça. Et je crois qu'on va peut-être rester sur cette note et que I would like to, I think we're going to, I think it's a bit late now, I don't know what time it is, but... Um, Very good. I, I, that's what's my plan. Bonsoir, Adil. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. And I just wanted to say that um, there are some people, people, of course, are fascinated by Mel. And uh, it's a pity that it's only now when he's no longer with us that, uh, well, he is with us. His, 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 he's very much with us with all his work. But still, People are now looking into his work, and all the, uh, many, many interesting questions ro- ro- arose tonight. And um, there's going to be an exhibition at the uh, Université de Montréal called Vive la Ville, Hommage à Mel Vincharni, pour ses, par ses élèves, that is by her students. And uh, so that's going to be fascinating to sort of see what, this, what, what the students took or what they thought. Uh, and that's going to be from the 30th of Jan- January to the 17th of March at the Center of Exhibition at the School of Architecture of the Université de Montréal. And then the uh, ARC, the uh, journal Architecture uh, Québec, the Architecture with the R is for, uh, uh, is um, doing a, uh, actually an issue on Melvin. And... Um, uh, Th- that's, um, I-, I think it's going to come out in-, in July or something like that. 
but I, I might be wrong about that. Does anybody know? Well, anyway, we'll find out. But so, so that will bring up other aspects of Melbourne. But then there's a very important book that's being done by Louis Martin, who is one of uh, Mel's students. And um, he is a professor at the Université de Québec à Montréal. And I suppose the, a person who has followed more closely than any other is Mel's uh, theoretical fascinations. And the um, book is called On Architecture, Melvin Charney, a critical anthology. And I think that's going to be come out in the spring, this, uh, 90 to, to 2013, yes, in the spring of this year. When you leave this room, CCA has an exhibition um, that we put up some uh, almost months ago on mail, on mail to Suse Ajamel, a au revoir mail it should be, because we are going to see him many times again. And the exhibition uh, is on the, um, the incredible thing, the Maison de la Rue Sherbrooke and, and, and uh, um, what is it called? Um, I always forget his name. Corridor. Corridor. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I don't know why. It just appears in my mind. Now I can see all the red and yellow slashes. Okay. And uh, also in the library, we have a lot of uh, the books on Mel, by Mel, and uh, 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 re uh, re uh, books that he also uh, collected. Uh, as I said, he was really a bibliophile. Uh, it wasn't because he was a bibliophile, it was because he was interested. He had a huge uh, uh, curiosity. And so that you'll see the books there. Then also, the book on uh, Gilet uh, uh, is also there. So you can sort of see what, with a kind of, what, what, what interested Mel uh, in, you know, in his work. And with that, I think we say au revoir, Mel, and thank you all for being here. Good night. <laughs>